Here's some tips to be able to get through the even problems for the ready, set, go for this work. For the first set, we're talking about the distributive property, which means that when we have something outside of a parentheses, we're going to distribute it to everything inside the parentheses. So if I have this, I'm going to multiply whatever's outside the parentheses into every term inside the parentheses. So let's go ahead and do that. For number two, we'll take a negative 12 and distribute it to both the 5x and the minus 4. Negative 12 times 5x times negative 12 or minus 12 times negative 4. So negative 12 times 5 is negative 60. The x stays with the term. And here, a negative 12 times a negative 4, negative times negative is a positive, so I should get a negative, or sorry, positive 48. Something to keep in mind here is because these are different terms, we cannot combine them. We have an x in one term and no x in another term, so our final here is negative 60x plus 48. For number four, we're taking 9x and distributing it in. So 9x times 6x plus 9x times negative 2. 9x times 6x is 54x, and because I have two x's here, I've got an x times an x, I would end up with x squared, and plus 9 times negative 2 will give me a negative 18 x. Keep in mind, once again, I cannot combine these because they are not like terms. So I will end up with 54x squared minus 18x. The next one, number six, looks challenging, but we can manipulate this a little bit. So one way of doing it, just one way, is to distribute this dividing by 5 in right away. So I'm going to take that dividing by 5 to both terms. Keep the 4a outside the parentheses. So 10 divided by 5 is 2, and the a follows. Negative 25 divided by 5 is negative 5, and the b follows. Then we distribute the 4a into both terms. So 4a times 2a plus 4a times negative 5b. Oh, look at that. I needed more space. I got more space. So 4a times 2a would be 8a, and I'm taking two a's, multiplying it together, so a squared plus 4 times 5 is 20, and a times b will just become a b. We don't combine the a, b, and turn it into b squared or a squared. We know that there's one a term and one b term multiplied together gives me a b. This is the simplified expression. For number 8, you are looking to see, do I have a linear, exponential, or some new kind of function? So what we'll look at here is we're going to look at common differences. So if you look here, 64 to 128, the difference there is 64. The difference here is 128. Ah, the difference here is 256, and the difference here is 512. So the difference between the two consecutive terms are not the same, therefore we know that it is not a linear function. What this will end up being is it will be an exponential function, because we are doubling it every time. We know that we are taking it to a, a square 
each time or and multiplying it by another version of the base each time. And the, the tricky part is going to be figuring out what that base is. So something else that you can do is you can work backwards and you can divide this by two and you can say, well, 64 divided by two is 32 and then 16 and then eight and then four and then two. So we know that what we are dealing with is f of n equaling 2 to the n power because we're taking and we're multiplying it by itself that many times. Now, if you're not there yet, that's fine. Recursive is trying to get us to think about what happens to get to the next step. So if you're looking at going the other way, so going from six to seven, seven to eight, eight to nine, nine to 10, and so on, thinking about what do I have to do to the previous term to get that term? Well, going from 64 to 128, I double it. 128 to 256, I double it. 256 to 512, double it. 512 to 1024, double it. So you can say that F of six equals 64. And we're going to say that F of n equals the previous term, so n minus one, times two. Pretty tricky right now. That's why we're going through this. But if I were to take a look at one more that might be a little bit easier for us to see, we have 11 to 13, two, 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 and two. So we can see that we are adding two each time. Interesting. So we know that this is going to be a linear function. The hard part now is figuring out what the explicit equation is going to be. What is that formula? If I plug in any number, it's going to be the definition. The, the function is going to be defined at that point. So we can say that in this case, I know that I'm going to be a common difference of two each time. So I'm trying to look at multiplying by two somewhere in there. And if I take two times 10, I get 20. Hmm, I need 19. If I take two times nine, I get 18, but I should get 17. If I take two times eight, hopefully you're seeing what's happening here. I multiply these by two and then I'm off by one. So I could say f of n equals 2n minus 1. For the recursive equation, f of 6 equals 11. And f of n is going to be the previous term plus 2. Because what we were doing up here was we were taking the previous term, adding 2, and getting the next term. Again, not something we've spent any time on in detail, but something to start getting the wheels going a little bit. For number 12, we are looking at finding the rate of change. So what we are looking at here really is it used to be something we called slope, but rate of change really is more specific. We want to be able to talk about how fast is something changing vertically as opposed to horizontally, or the y value as opposed to the x value, or a number of different ways of doing this, output to input. So number 12, you can look at, I see that it, it is at zero, or zero comma one, and it goes down and it hits over here. So I know that it goes down one, two, three spaces. So that would be a negative three and over one space. So the rate of change could be negative three over one. We're gonna leave this as a fraction right now because rate of change is going to be 
a vertical and a horizontal, an input and an output that we're going to have to analyze. For number 14, we know that we have a plus five. So this plus five means that every time I'm going to the next step, I'm adding five, which means that my rate of change is that every five, we're going and doing something new. Now, number 16 should look pretty familiar because it was on the blue sheet that we were working through. So for this one, we're gonna say x1 and y1, x2 and y2. And the reason why we're doing that is we're trying to give ourselves a mental heads up of which coordinate pair we're talking about. And when we're trying to find the slope between two points, we're talking about the rate of change, so the change of y over the change of x, we are looking for y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. So now it's a matter of looking at your notes here and seeing what you have. Well, my y2 was negative 16. My y1 was 12. So remember, we're taking minus y1 over my x2 is negative 11 and my x1 is negative 3. Negative times a negative gives me a positive, and now I can start to get to work. Negative 16 minus 12 gives me negative 28, and negative 1 plus 3 gives me negative 8. If I simplify this down, I should get a rate of change that is 7 over 2. And finally, for number 18, we're looking here at common differences. So notice here that it's going up by 0 0.5. 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So you can say that your rate of change here is 0 0.5, or I can turn this into a fraction and call it 1 half. Hopefully that helps. Reach out if you have any questions.